Okay, well, if you're like me, you were happy to hear and relieved to hear that the second impeachment is over yesterday. All that mess is finished, I hope. <laughs> I hope now that our elected officials will get back to or actually get to the, the business of the people and to do what they were elected to do. And so I, we can be in prayer for that. And, you know, you, you look back now, it kind of brings a close to things over the past five years, really. But uh, I got to thinking about this yesterday. There's a lot of fence mending that's going to have to be done in this nation because of the words that have been spoken and the actions that have been taken. And uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of groups, political groups, ethnic, religious groups. Uh, far too many hateful words were, were threw about in this country. A lot of emotion, and I'm not making a defense of, of anything. I'm just making a simple statement that we've seen a lot go on. Uh, you ever wonder or think about how in the world do we mend these fences? How, how do we actually, as a, as a country, get back to where uh, we were civility and, and treating people with kindness and caring about people uh, like it used to be more so than it is now? Well, as I was writing this sermon last night, I thought, well, it's pretty good fortune that today's Valentine's Day because uh, of what it signifies, and I haven't, but I do want to wish everyone a, a happy Valentine's Day today. Hopefully all the cards and the flowers and the candy has been bought and, and handed out, but it's still not too late for you fellows that may have forgotten. You can still go get your cards and candy and, and such, so uh, it's, not, uh, it's not over till 11.59 tonight, so you still have a few hours. Love is what this holiday is about. And I honestly believe that the only thing that's going to uh, mend the fences in this country is love. Godly Christian love is what will help to mend uh, and bring us back together. And uh, that's what I want to look at this morning. Surprise, surprise, right? Christian love here on Valentine's Day. but. But really, it's something that we have to be able to understand and really hold within our hearts and have within ourselves because if we don't have true Christian love, then we're not going to be able to fulfill our function that, that God would have us to do. So I'd like for you, we're going to start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, just to, to use that as our base. But we're, all of our study is going to come from 1 John this morning. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and we're familiar with this. It says, And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Now, many of your translations for charity, it will say love. The greatest of these, faith, hope, and love. The greatest is love. And for us as a Christian, that's what we have to be reminded of and have to remember and have to put in it to our hearts, actually is the greatest thing that we can have is love. Because if we even remember what Jesus said when asked, how he replied when he was asked, what is the greatest commandments? And he, and he said, love the, the Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So love is central to the Christian. Love is something that we all must have. And with that, I wanted to look at the writing of John this morning and, and think about how that the greatest is love. So if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles over to 1 John and think about this in this respect. I know we're getting ready to have snow, and, but as according to weather, when it rains, people see us with umbrellas. And when it's snow, we bundle up and, and dress warm. And when it's hot, we, we seek out shade or we seek out air conditioning and we know that it's hot on everyone. But how is it that people see the love of a Christian? How is it that that, that can be identified? And that's what I want to, and I think John does an excellent job here uh, into giving us some pointers. And we'll begin in chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. And first and foremost is our love for others. He writes in verse 7, Beloved, 
Let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. And if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. So we think about what he says there in verse 12. No man, no one walking on this earth today has ever seen God, but how will they see God except through us? How will they know God's love except that we show God's love? And that's what this whole passage is about. It's the fact that God loved us before uh, we were lovable. Not that we were ever lovable, but he always loved us. He loved us in our sins. And that's the example for us. We have to love people. We don't love or condone sin, but we love the person. In the same way that Jesus loved us. God loved us before we loved him. He loved us in our sin, not because of our sin, but just the fact that he knew that we were sinners. But he still loved us, and he sent Jesus, his son, to be that substitute for us, to be that acceptable sacrifice for us. And our love is supposed to be evidence of God's love. And that's what we have to display to people. I think we're fortunate. I think we're... the some of the most fortunate people in the world to live where we live. Because we've not been touched with a lot of the controversy in our area that much of our nation has seen. And that's truly a blessing. So we need to be in prayer for those that are in, in more difficult circumstances than we are. We need to be in prayer for those Christians that are in places where a lot of this turmoil and a lot of this hate and a lot of this... Uh, fighting and stuff has been going on because could you imagine how difficult it would be how much of a challenge it would be as a Christian to display God's love under those circumstances yeah we're really fortunate here that we don't have to really so much worry about that does that mean we still don't display God's love not at all we do that and we seek out and strive to do that in each way that we can and certainly being in prayer for those other folks that, that maybe don't have such an easy time or live in a place where it's not such a, uh, an issue. And think about this. Ask yourself this question. Would I want the kind of love that I display? Would I want the kind of love offered to me that I display? Is the love that I show a fair representation of God's love? That's, that, that's one that will make you think now, isn't it? When you look in the mirror, think about that. Could a person that is not a Christian see God's love in me? And if any of us answers no to any of those questions, then we have some work to do, don't we? We have some things that we need to, to strive for, to be more like Jesus, to be able to display God's love in a better and more perfect way so that we could answer yes to those questions, so that we could, people could see us as Christians and could see the love of God. We have to show our love for people because certainly we know that God loves all of his creation. We know that. Just like from our study last week about Cain and Abel. We know that one had the sacrifice that was acceptable. The other did not have acceptable. Uh, and even in Cain's failure, what did God tell him? He said, if, you, if, you don't, if you'll just do right, you would be accepted, right? But he chose not to. And that's what we have to do. 
We have to be able to encourage people through God's love, through our love for people, to do right and to be acceptable. Now, if you look on over in verse 16, we'll see something else that, that has to do with Christian love. And that's our faith and love for God. Our faith in, I guess you have to say. Our faith in God and our love for God. And we know, and we have known and believe the love that God hath unto us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Do we understand that without God, love is really impossible? Matter of fact, God made love possible. God defined love. It would be impossible to show love and compassion to feel love. Hear what John said there in that first line? We know and we believe. We know and we believe. We have to have the feeling, we have to know the feeling of God's love to know it. We have to have experienced it. And once we experience that God's love, that's through salvation, of course. And we believe that. There's a direct, direct correlation, I guess you could say, with faith in there, too. The more we love God, the more trust we put in God, the more faith that we have in God. So if you have little faith, then I think it would be reasonable to say we have little love for, for people. Well, I'm not saying you don't love your wife or your husband or your kids or your grandkids or niece, whatever that may be. I'm talking about a general love of people. And there's a difference in that. I mean, we expect ourselves and, and, and know that we love our family, and that's easy to do. That's what Jesus talked about is that we love people that love us. That's the easy part. How do you love people that don't love you? That's the difficult part, and that's what Jesus came to teach us about. That's where God's love comes into play. Because God's love allows us to love, care for, have compassion for, people that, that do not give that back to us. Does that mean that we're not supposed to extend that? Absolutely not. Because of our faith, because of our love that we have for God, we can and will extend that to people that doesn't love us, that doesn't show compassion for us, that doesn't share our same point of view. We ever think about it that way? I mean, we, that's who we gather around, isn't it? We, we, we have friends, and, and most of the time our families share the, the same general point of view. But what about someone that has a point of view that's completely different than yours? Does that mean that we don't show them love? That we don't show compassion? That we don't show the same love that God has for them? Absolutely not. Even the more so. And I remind you, who was it that Jesus went and ministered to? He ministered to the people that was that way, had a completely opposite view of things. That society had said, nope, I can't deal with that. That is bad. That's sin. That's wrong. But that's exactly who Jesus dealt with. That's who he went to. Why? Love. Love's what leads us to do that. And our faith in God and our love for God should be seen by people because of we're enabled to do that very thing. Our next point is very, very similar to that. It's in our daily lives. Look back in chapter 2, verses 15, 16, and 17. 1 John 2, 15, 16, and 17. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What do people see us pursuing? A Christian should be pursuing things that are different. Things that the world pursues 
things that the world holds in high value, the Christian should know, and we should display that in our daily lives, that those have no value. You can't be a, a fence rider. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in a relationship with God. You know, talked about that in Revelations. And that's being lukewarm. And what did Jesus say? He would rather have us cold or hot because the lukewarm is nothing. Matter of fact, talk about spewing it out of the mouth. Cold can be made hot. The lukewarm, the fence rider, doesn't display in their daily life integrity of a Christian, integrity of God's love. Chase after the same things that people that have no relationship with God chase after, knowing that they have no more value than, than any other worldly thing. We're called to be different. I mean, anybody can come to church a few times a year. Uh, you can give money. Uh, you can profess that you're a Christian and never have a change in your life. Never desire to love people as God loved people, to see people through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Anyone can do that and say that and go through those actions and never really display the love of God. And without a change in our daily lives, without a change that people can visibly see, can we really be experiencing and showing God's love? Now, I remember when I first became a Christian, a very, very good friend of mine uh, was kind of shocked. And, he, and I told him, and I remember saying, I said, I, listen, I'm the same old Rob that I always was. And I spoke that out of immaturity and ignorance because I wasn't the same Rob. I wanted in my mind to think that, that I hadn't changed. In a lot of ways, I haven't changed as far as how I treat people. I've always treated people good, I hope. Uh, but what has changed about Rob, the old Rob to the new Rob, is the things that Rob finds important, the things that Rob finds value in, and the things that Rob pursues has changed greatly. And that's what I think he's talking about there. And that's what I think Jesus is trying to get across to all of us. The things that the world says is important, the things that, that the world says makes you a success are of no value. They're no value in the eyes of God without love. Without love, we have to be able to display love. We have to be able to have love and faith in God, and we have to be able to show love in our daily lives. Not love of things, but love of the, the Creator, love of our Savior, love of our fellow man. We have to live our lives that reflects that changed person, a person that's guided by God's love and not by the lust of the world, as John says. Which brings us to this next point. In chapter 4, again, back over to your right, verses 18 through 21. 1 John 4, 18 through 21. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment, and he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And if any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar, for he that loveth is not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he, all, he who loveth God love his brother also. Fear. Fear of rejection, fear of ridicule, sometimes that holds us back from love, doesn't it? I mean, no one wants to be rejected. No one wants to have ridicule because we have compassion and show the love of, of Christ to people. And sometimes people that we think are our friends will, will ridicule us because of that compassion. Sometimes the people that we love hurt us, don't they? We're human. That's going to happen. We're going to hurt the ones we love. We're going to have people that... that ridicule us because we're trying to follow the example of Christ 
trying to follow the example of compassion and love for one another, and we really find out that those people are not so much our friends, don't we? But does that mean that we stop, that we withdraw our love? No. That's what John's saying here is you can't have love and fear. Let's look at that again, what he says in verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. You can kind of relate that to a mother and a child that's in danger. Regardless of the danger that's to the child, the mother or father will rush in and do whatever it takes to save the child from the danger, regardless of the fear of the situation. So when we see that pure love in action that way, it gives us a little glimpse of what God gives to us, is that pure love and encourages us to have that we can't have fear. We can't have fear of consequence when we have love because that's all we have is love and the consequence of love is hope when we love someone when we show someone love when we display the love of God when we tell them about the love of Christ that gives them that person hope we can't have fear and have hope we love him because he first loved us, John says in verse 19. We can't say that I love God and hate my brother, he says in verse 20. It's impossible for us to do that. Because if we're a Christian and we say that I love God, we know that God loves all. And if we hate someone that, God's love, that God loves, then how can we have the love of God in us? We can't do it, can we? And there we find ourselves in that quandary. But Rob, he, he or she hurt me. He or she said something about me or about one of my family members that caused a lot of pain, a lot of grief for me. I understand. That happens. That happens with imperfect people. But here's the good thing and the hope that we have as Christians. You don't ever have to worry about that with coming from God. He's not going to hurt your feelings. He's going to love you. He's not going to disappoint you as our friends and family and acquaintances will. God's going to love you. And that's something that we will never be separated from is the love of God. And that's what John, I think, is trying to get to us, that we can love without fear. We can have a fearless love because of who stands behind us, who loves us more than anyone we could ever imagine. And it's hard to think about somebody that loves you more than your mother. But God loves us more than our moms do. Jesus loves us more than our moms do. And it's hard for us to reconcile that in our mind. But they do. And because they have that kind of love for us, we can have a fearless <laughs> love as well. We can't live our whole lives in fear. Fear of hurt. Fear of ridicule because we missed the whole example. Jesus was hurt, wasn't he? I would think he was hurt by the disappoint, by the rejection of the people he was sent to save, by uh, even the rejection of his disciples. He was hurt by the lack of love and lack of compassion that was shown to him. Did that stop him from loving? No. He loved us all the way to the cross and beyond. He did not let the complete and total rejection of his love stop him from loving. And we shouldn't either. We should love anyway. Our love should be fearless. Which brings us to our last point. How is it that we can do that? How is it that we can have great faith and love and, and, and show compassion, show the love of God, and show the compassion of Christ to other people? Well, look over in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It's because we have an understanding of what will be. John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us 
that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. And that's our hope as Christians. That's how we can have love. Love and faith in God is because we believe what he says. We are heirs to Jesus Christ. It's what the Bible tells us. Sons and daughters of God. With the promise that Jesus returns, we will see him and we will be made like unto him and we will see him for what he is, which is Savior, King of kings, Lord of lords, Savior of all who have <laughs> accepted him as such. And we can move forward in love because we know what will be. Sadly, you ask many, many, many people today, what happens when you die? What happens at the end of the world? Many people will say, I don't know. Many people have no hope of Jesus Christ returning to call away his church. First the dead, we know what the scriptures tells us. The dead in Christ shall rise first and meet him in the air. And then those that are left will be called up. Could you imagine walking through life not knowing what's going to happen at the end? Or to thinking that once you're buried and in the ground it's all over. You have no hope of anything ever again. When the simple fact is the Bible tells us the truth what will happen. And it's because of that truth that John is able to say this, that what we just read. Beloved, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. The world don't know us because they didn't know him, he says. We are the sons of God, and it doesn't appear yet what we shall be, but we know that he shall appear, and we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. We have an understanding of what will be. We have faith in what will come. We don't keep reaching for the back, the things that are gone, the things that are past. We don't keep trying to, to get hope and satisfaction out of things that are no more. We have a future. We have a future that's built out of love. We have a future that was displayed in love at Calvary's cross. That's what we celebrated when we take the communion, is love. Love's what drives you there. Just like the mother that would put herself in harm's way, risk her own life for her child, you can imagine the cross is the same for Jesus. He was not going to allow something to harm us without intervening. And the cross is that intervention. In the same way that a, a parent will intervene for their child's safety. Well, we're talking about eternal safety is what the cross intervened. That we might not be forever separated from God. Separated from the love of God. Because of sin. Because not accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. Having heard the word but never believed the word. Or maybe believing but never acting upon it, never allowing it to make a change in us and say, I need to repent of my sins and accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Which would lead us to baptism for the remission of those sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can have a guide. When we're raised from that watery grave of baptism, we're changed. We leave the old man buried and raised as a new. And we walk faithful until death, until what? Until what, G, uh, what John just said. We know that when he returns, we will see him for what he is, and we will be like him. That's what love is. God made that definition, you know. He defined love. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13, 13 as we close. Faith, hope, and love, remember? The greatest of this is love. The love of God. 
the love of his son and our savior Jesus Christ and our love because he loved us first he sent Christ to us and because of that because of that great love we can show love to others so that's my Valentine's message is that Christian love begins to mend the fences not only in this nation but maybe in our families we have some fence mending I don't know maybe there's some relationships between friends that need to be mended and the only way that that happens is through love is through the eyes of compassion and the only eyes that we can see without fear to do those things is through the eyes of God So how do people see your love? Are you anchored to that rock of our salvation which John writes about or are we tossed around? If you've never accepted Christ, I want to encourage you to do that today. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation here just in a minute. Have you really been a friend to him? Have you truly committed yourself now that we've went through this? Maybe you're a Christian and you realize, you know what? I've not truly committed myself to God's love and loving people as God would have me to love them, but I will. I'm going to start doing that today. Well, I encourage you to do that as well. In either case, if you have a decision to make, would you come as we stand and sing number up 21, have you really been a friend to him, the first and the third verse for our hymn of invitation.